Yeah, so it's 12 o'clock, it's Eastern Washington University and Columbia Basin Geologic Society. Um, we're starting something new here, we're trying to be able to see people's faces and, and talk. Um, it's still nice if we can keep muted the whole time and then hold the discussion till the very end. Um, feel free to turn off your camera whenever you need to and come back in. Uh, but I'm really looking forward to, to today's talk um, for sure. I've been on a couple of field trips with Dr. Vic Baker, or Vic Camp, sorry, Victor Camp. And uh, man, I, in all honesty, I told everybody this, including Vic, that it was uh, Camp and Ross in 2004. That publication, I read that while I was sitting down as a regulator for the state of Hawaii. And I said, I got to go to Eastern Washington, go work with Rick Connery and that crew and, and learn about some stuff. And I had a blast. And uh, it's great to have Vic here today. He had a, meet, a paper that just came out in GSA today. Um, and that was with Ray Wells, another wonderful, wonderful geologist. Um, but without further ado, uh, Victor Camp, Columbia Basin, welcomes you in Eastern Washington University. And I will mute so that ring goes away. Thank you. Thanks very much, Chad. I, I'm looking forward to this talk. Um, I have a, a fair number of slides, so I'm going to go through this pretty quickly. And because uh, I want to give people a chance to ask questions at, at, at the end. Um, so uh, I guess I'll I'll head on out. I, I want to start a little bit just uh, first talking about a little bit of background because uh, you know there's been controversy over a long period of time about whether or not uh, the Columbia River basalts and the Yellowstone hotspot track are related to a, a mantle plume. So I just want to talk about this a little with a little bit of uh, uh, educational background just to remind people about mantle plumes a little bit. Because we have a mantle plume, the, the idea, at least the hypothetical idea, is that it's derived from the hottest part of the mantle, which is the core mantle boundary. And then it rises up through the mantle where it impinges eventually on, on the lithosphere to do its damage on the, on the surface. But the key in understanding mantle plumes is that they're thought to be divided into two parts, a large bulbous plume head, as you see here, and a thin plume tail uh, that feeds into the head. And the flux of that tail moves upward at a faster rate than the plume head can actually move through the mantle. So the result of that is that the plume head over time actually expands, you know, gets larger and larger as it rises up and eventually again impinges on the, on the lithosphere. And when it impinges, it spreads out at the asthenosphere uh, because the asthenosphere is weak, so it's really can do so. If you look at this little simple cross section in the lower left, you can see how it spreads out. But the key thing here uh, is to look at the temperature and the temperature is always going to be hottest right above the plume tail. And as it spreads out, it's going to be cooler uh, farther out on the outer reaches of the, of the spreading plume head. The idea uh, here is that uh, plume heads are what produce large oceanic plateaus and continental flood basalt promises. But it's the plume tail, you know, once the head dissipates, it's the plume tail that produces hotspot tracks like we have in, uh, in Hawaii. And we usually either see, you know, a large uh, continental flood basalt or oceanic plateau or a uh, hotspot track, but not the two together. But there are a few uh, places where we can do that. And one is the uh, Tristan de Kuna hotspot, which is very near the Mid Atlantic Ridge. And because it's a near um, mid oceanic ridge hotspot, it produces two hotspot tracks that are connected to flood basalt provinces, Antandaka flood basalts in Africa and the Piranha flood basalts here in, in South America. And these flood basalts were produced when the plume arrived, uh, flood basalt volcanism began on Pangaea and then Pangaea began to break apart, also splitting apart the, the two flood basalt provinces, but the hotspot is, is still there. So if we think of that model, and then we think about our portion of the world uh, where we have Yellowstone, and, you know, why Yellowstone has been associated with the plume is largely because of the rhyolites. Uh, and there's been, uh, you know, ages that have been over the years, many uh, ages have been uh, uh, obtained on the rhyolites and they show a, a relatively progressive trend of older ages off to the, to the Southwest uh, in the direction of plate motion. So this would be real, real consistent to, at least by analogy to the uh, Hawaiian hotspot track. Um, so that's a good indication uh, that this is, in fact, a hotspot track associated with a plume tail. And if we think of the model, then, of course, the closest uh, flood basalt province to this would be uh, the Columbia River flood basalts, and then that should be produced by the, the, the man plume head. 
So is it true? Did we have a mantle plume head? Do we today have a, a mantle plume tail underneath Yellowstone? Well, one of the major problems uh, to this model has always been uh, the main eruption site for the Columbia Basalts, and that's in the Chief Joseph Dyke Swarm up here. And the Chief Joseph Dyke Swarm, you know, erupted about 85% of the entire volume of the Columbia Basalts. So there's actually a gap here of about 400 kilometers um, from McDermott Caldera here, which is, had been thought to be the southwestern uh, part of the, uh, the hotspot track. And of course, the main eruption site like for Columbia River Basalt. So this didn't quite fit. Um, however, um, there, there are a lot, there's a lot of outcrops here in southeastern uh, Washington um, of another group of, of basalts, which many of you know of, the, the, the Steens basalts. Uh, and they're largely covered uh, by, uh, by younger volcanic promises. And Peter Hooper, um, you know, he was always in the forefront of what to do. And he decided, you know, after working many, many years on uh, the Columbia basalts, he was convinced that these basalts, the stains were somehow uh, associated with the uh, uh, flood basalt problems itself. So in 2002, he and, uh, and, and his co-authors uh, produced a paper um, in this area, the Moyer Gorge, uh, where basalts that look like steam basalts were present. And he indeed identified them uh, as sitting above, or I should say the steam basalts sitting below what appeared to be a Maha basalts, which in turn had uh, basalts of similar chemistry that appeared very uh, chemically similar to Grand Ron basalts. So he suggested the idea that uh, the steam basalts were the lowest uh, unit in the Columbia basalt formation. And at the same time that Peter was working in the Moyer Gorge, uh, Marty Ross and I, uh, if you look who you see here on the left-hand side of this image, uh, another Columbia River Basalt uh, uh, student of uh, Peter's for many years, um, we decided to start mapping these uh, seven and a half minute quadrangles from the Moyer Gorge to Steams. And we indeed identified that stratigraphy that we could trace all, trace all the way over to Steams Mountain. Uh, so there is in fact, a stratigraphic relationship here uh, where Imnaha basalt largely overlies Steens basalts, but also par probably also partly interbedded with Steens basalts as well. So the importance of that is that now we've identified uh, the lowest part of the Columbia basalts that extends all the way down to the McDermott caldera. And that's important because it now gives us a temporal connection, but also a spatial connection with the Yellowstone uh, hotspot track. It turns out the McDermott caldera, right in this area, I haven't uh, drawn it in, but, but I should, it's right in this area. The oldest rhyolites here is 16.5 million years old, and the oldest uh, ages that we have for steam basalts are 16.7 million years old. So this is really a bimodal province in the southern portion of the Columbia basalts. So this fits very nicely with the Columbia basalts being the plume head. The plume head was then sheared off against the cratonic boundary, which you see right, right here, therefore exposing the plume tail to produce a nice hotspot track that we currently see the plume tail here at the Yellowstone National Park. A very nice model. And this is uh, something that Marty Ross and I published that uh, Chad referred to earlier, uh, this, uh, this model where the plume rose up near the uh, thick cratonic boundary, uh, uh, climber air basalts were produced, and then the plume head was sheared off, therefore allowing the plume tail to produce Yellowstone uh, hotspot track. So it fits very nicely, but there's always been um, a little concern about this model. And the concern has to do uh, with the volume of the climber air basalts. And all you guys know, because you've probably been down in the canyon lands of uh, Washington and, and Oregon, and you see these canyons and you look at the walls and what you see are vast amounts of, um, of uh, flood basalts. You know, one pancake layer on top of another. Uh, this bench represents the contact between the Naha basalt. But in reality, when you compare it to other uh, flood basalt provinces on Earth and oceanic plateaus, it's not. It's actually a very small uh, uh, area, uh, I should say volume. Uh, this uh, diagram by Nicky Moore is quite nice. It shows the time of, Columbia, of uh, flood basalt vol volcanism on earth and also the volume uh, produced by that volcanism. And when we compare the Columbia River basalts, the youngest flood basalt province that we have on earth to the volume 
of these oceanic plateaus and other continental flood basalts is very small. You know, it's an order of magnitude or, uh, uh, or more smaller uh, than, than most. So that doesn't quite fit the model of a normal uh, plume head. So that's always been a, a little bit of a concern. And there is an alternative here. And I, all, all, I really wanna give uh, uh, Bob Duncan uh, credit for this paper uh, because I think it, it wasn't given enough credit early on that he published back in 1982, a captured island chain on the coast ranges of Oregon and Washington, where he described um, a series of basalts that have been plastered onto the sides of uh, uh, Western North America, west of the, uh, of the Cascade, but today we call it Silesia, which I'm sure many of you have heard of. And he suggested that this was an oceanic plateau that was accreted onto North America as a result of a mantle plume. And he looked around, he saw the closest plume around must be Yellowstone, so this must have been Yellowstone uh, that produced this oceanic plateau. And if that model is correct, then that means that the Columbia River basalts are not the plume head. They're not a product of the plume head. The plume head actually produced Silesia. Uh, and so then there's a question, you know, is the Yellowstone uh, plume, did it arrive as a starting plume head? Or uh, did the plume head produce an oceanic plateau that was then accreted onto North America? And uh, as I say, this paper didn't get a lot of traction for, uh, for a few decades. Um, but it was always in the back of, of a lot of people's head, uh, heads, I should say. And um, there was a paper by Ray Wells and, and the co-authors that, that you can see here that includes, in fact, um, uh, Bob Duncan, uh, The Geologic History of Silesia. This was published in uh, 2013, an excellent paper with a lot of geology in it. Uh, but in describing all aspects of uh, Silesia in, in this uh, uh, paper, uh, the conclusion of the, of the paper is that indeed Silesia had been dried from a, from a mantle plume and had the characteristics, and we'll talk about that a little bit more uh, later. And then a few years after this, um, myself along with my co-authors, Marty Ross, Bob Duncan again, co-author on both paper, papers, and Dave Kimbrough, uh, we wrote a paper <coughs> called Uplift, Rupture, and Rollback of the Fairlawn Slab reflected in volcanic perturbations on the Yellowstone Adekite hotspot track. Well, we threw the term Adekite in here because uh, we recognize the rock type that's uh, erupted about 30 to 20 million years ago that falls along the same trend as the Yellowstone Snake River uh, uh, plain hotspot track. And we'll talk about that. Um, but I realized early on that if you look at these two papers together, there's a story. And I talked about this with Ray and we decided that we really need to produce a, a summary paper uh, to describe this. And we did so, and this is what was just published that Chad referred to in GSA today, the case for a long lived and robust Yellow, Yellowstone hotspot. So we agree with Duncan in this paper uh, that the true plume head uh, is, is what produced um, uh, Silesia that accreted on, onto North America. So I wanna give you a little bit of, of that background. Uh, if we look at the paper by McCory and Wilson in 2013, what you're looking at in the, in the inset here in the, in the upper left are Cretaceous to, uh, uh, to Eocene uh, magnetic anomalies on, on the seafloor. And if you reconstruct these going back in time, uh, let's go down here to 50 million years ago, uh, this is what uh, the construction looked like. We have the Kula Plate in the north, we have the Pacific Plate down here, and the Juan de Fuca slash Farallon Plate uh, uh, down here. So there's a triple junction here of, of rifts that separate these, uh, the, these different plates. Um, now, you'll also notice in this diagram these small little dots. You know, one's a triangle and one is a, a circle. And I'm going to blow this area up over here, or, or I'm not going to do it, but McCory and Wilson did it for us. And again, you can see the Kula plate, the so-called resurrection plate, which is may or may not be, be present, and the uh, Wanda Fuca plate slash Fairlawn plate down here. And here you see these two uh, uh, dots. What these represent uh, is uh, the Yellowstone hotspot as determined by plate motions from McCory and, and, and Wilson. And they they thought, well, if, if in fact uh, there is a long lived uh, hotspot, then you can trace this back using, using plate motions on where it would be. And these two uh, uh, symbols, uh, the diamond type, uh, type symbol represents uh, plate motions associated with the Pacific plate and the circle are those plate motions associated with the Atlantic plate. 
Um, the mid-oceanic ridge that separates the Farallon plate from the Kula slash resurrection plate is, is, is right here. So, so this was an important paper and it was useful also to the wells, to wells at all. And what they did is they, they produced kind of similar diagrams here. But what you'll see in this case are three different potential locations for the Yellowstone plume. Uh, these are the two locations that we have in Mercury and Wilson, but a third location uh, that is not based on a stationary plume, but it's based on a, on, on a, a plume that's, uh, that moves over time. Uh, and the reason we have this other location is because uh, this is a, a, a near oceanic, mid-oceanic ridge location that would be similar to the Tristan de Cunha that we talked about earlier. And uh, they thought this was important because it, it appears uh, when you look at the magnetic anomalies uh, that we actually had two oceanic terrains here that 50 million years ago was a single one that split up. Uh, one split away on the Kula plate and the other one uh, uh, split away eventually accreted with North America on the, uh, the Farallon, Farallon place. S that you see here is the Celebsi terrain and the Yadatat, uh, Yad Yad I always get this wrong, Yakatak uh, uh, terrain is here. And over time, once this collided, the Yakutat terrain then moved over transform motion all the way up, uh, creating onto Alaska to the north. But Celestia stayed here in the Pacific Northwest, and that's where we are today. Um, so, using that that model, um, you know, Cile before Celestia arrived, you know, we did have uh, a subduction occurring, uh, but it was very flat subduction. Everybody knows the, this story: flat subduction all all in North America. And the flat subduction of the Pacific Northwest uh, is thought to produce the chalice magmatic arc, you know, far inland from where we have the Cascades today. But once the Letzia collided uh, about, uh, well, 40, 48, 50 million years ago, uh, then that collision caused the trench to flip over to the western side of Celestia, and uh, the subduction regime became steeper. So we produced the very earliest uh, volcanism we have on the Cascades somewhere between 48 and 45 uh, million years ago. Uh, the Akatat terrain today is up here in Alaska. You can see this green symbol right in here. And the Celestia terrain is here in this box, which I'll blow up. This is from Wells and McCafferty. Everything you see in green is uh, Celestia. The actual outcrops uh, are the dark green, you know, quite a large number of outcrops that we have. To go all the way from uh, Vancouver Island all the way down into southern uh, uh, Oregon. So, um, you know, in terms of age, age, uh, ages, uh, you know, there's a lot of ages that are uh, uh, obtained by various types from uh, these uh, two different groups and summarized largely in wells and all. Uh, the Celestia uh, Oceanic Plateau formed from 56 to 49 million years ago. It accreted around 50 million years ago. The trench developed to the west and cascade, earliest cascade volcanism began at uh, 48, 45 million years ago. And then uh, the hotspot was still located a little bit farther to the, to the west and at 42 to 34 million years ago, uh, it entered the trench and North American plate started to override the hotspot. Now the evidence for this, uh, the overriding of, of the hotspot comes from another group of volcanics that that are associated with Celestia, but they're subaerial. Uh, they're not submarine. You know, all the outcrops you see here in green are submarine Celestia uh, basalts for the most part. And what you see in yellow are the tilament uh, basalts. And these are actually subaerially exposed and they have chemical uh, identifiers that are more consistent with the plume component uh, than uh, the other basalts that we have in Celestia, although they are also associated with that component. But, it has a greater uh, strength uh, here in the uh, Tillamook volcanics. So we believe that the oceanic plateau uh, is Celestia, but the Tillamook, severely exposed, represents those basalts directly over the hotspot with the larger component than component. So here, uh, you know, typical Celestia volcanics, the pillar basalts, subarea exposed Tillamook volcanics. And you see, you know, nice columns here uh, in the Tillamook volcanics uh, uh, exposure. So I mentioned the evidence, uh, and there's a lot of evidence here, and I'm not going to go through that. I'll go through this very quickly, actually. The one thing that you need is you need to have a hotspot nearby in order to produce that plateau. 
And that was established by McCory and Wilson, also Mueller, Mueller et al. in 2016, that the location of the hotspot would be consistent with formation of that plateau. Uh, the field and the chronological data is consistent with the timing of, of Celestia. In terms of volume calculations, they're very consistent with a large uh, igneous province, a large oceanic plateau that is much larger than the Columbia River a flood of volume and more consistent with uh, the others that we showed on the, on the, the volume diagram. Here's it's that, that model. They had osmium uh, uh, isotopic ratios in the mega lavas and elevated helium uh, on the olefinocris in, in, in those lavas, consistent with a plume source. Trace element and starting in neodymium isotopic data, it's also consistent with a plume source. And lastly, Mantle temperature calculations that are well above ambient mantle and more, more consistent with a, with a hot mantle plume. The other thing I want to point out here uh, that we have to consider about Celestia is that where it is today is where it was when it first accreted uh, because we've had this constant clockwise rotation. Uh, so we actually have to, uh, if we're going to think about models, you know, we have to bring Celestia back to its original position. And we can do that by moving Celestia uh, as it exists today, about 300 kilometers to the south. Uh, and that's what uh, 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 Ray and I have done in this uh, paper that at this point that I'll, uh, I'll start to talk about. So this is a funny diagram because it's only partly palanspastic on the, on the right, uh, left-hand side, but the rest of it is geographically similar to what, to what we have today. Uh, so what we've done is we've taken Silesia, moved it back into its position about 40 million years ago in the Cascade Arc in the same way, uh, you know, the very earliest small volume, uh, uh, say 45 uh, million year volcanics are, are in this area. Um, the diamond and the circle represent um, the position of Macquarie and Wilson for the, for the hotspot track. But the Tillamook volcanics, which, which, uh, which we put in here in this lighter blue, would indicate that maybe the hotspot at 40 million years ago was a little bit farther to the, to the northeast, perhaps, in, in, in this area. And the other thing I want to notice, uh, or I want to point out, is this dotted line right here, which is a hypothetical hotspot track uh, for Yellowstone uh, that's based on the plate motions of, of Matthews et al. 2016. Assuming that at 40 million years the hotspot was located right, right, right here, so this is kind of a, a, a marker that we believe is very close uh, to uh, to the uh, uh, geologic processes that we see on 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 the surface. So the other things that you see here in different carry in different colors, and this would include uh, Silesia, uh, represents a progression of ages. And the second part of this diagram uh, shows an age progression from 40 million years all the way up to the present time. And it's color coded for these different promises uh, that we see here on the, on the surface. Most of these are, are rhyolite provinces uh, that are thought to form over the plume tail, you know, not over the colder portion of, of, of the plume head. I say most of them, but not all of them. Uh, some of them are, are, are something else. So I want to just remind everybody that the plume tail is where we have the hardest part of the plume. And this is the area that's capable of producing rhyolites because we have to produce hot basalt, not normal temperature basalt, but a little bit hotter. Uh, and that hot basalt can then rise into the crust to melt rhyolite or to produce rhyolite through the melting of uh, uh, crustal materials. And uh, the massive amount of rhyolite that we have along the hotspot track, we believe is located uh, uh, right through here. But um, that rhyolite, get, although it gets older, it only gets older to about 17 million years uh, in, in here, you know, this sort of yellow color, about 17 uh, million years old. Um, so um, do we have rhyolite that's older than that? Yes, we do. But I want to talk first about the volcanism that occurs uh, between 30 and 20 million years, all the way up to about 17 million years, because that's part of the hotspot track that most people didn't recognize. And, where we think we can, we can recognize the continuation of the hotspot track. So I want to just summarize this quickly on this. So you can forget about the 
I'll, I'll talk more about the diagrams on the left, but I just want to point out that from 30 to 20 million years, there were some regional perturbations in, in Oregon and adjacent California and uh, uh, northern northwestern Nevada that are, are consistent in, in, in widespread and dramatic in terms of, of, of how they appeared, how they formed, how they disappeared, and how they formed again. So from 30 to 20 million years, uh, this is a period where we had uh, throughout the entire back arc area of the Southern Cascades in Oregon, uh, we had high potassium calcalkaline volcanism and localized adiclite volcanism, which I'll talk about in a little bit. So that's from 30 to 20 MA, but at 22 MA, that volcanism started away and then it ceased altogether at 20 MA. And then we went through a hiatus in volcanism altogether, a regional hiatus, not localized. Uh, from about 20 to 22 MA to 17 MA, where there was no volcanism. But then when volcanism reappeared, it was entirely different. It wasn't high potassium calcalkaline volcanism. Instead, it was tholeitic flood basalt volcanism and bimodal volcanism with massive amounts of rhyolite associated with tholeitic flood basalts. So something happened uh, here to make this uh, fairly abrupt transition. So why do we have a hiatus? Why do we have the transition in these two different types of volcanic uh, uh, activity. So you can see here the answer, we go from uh, volcanism where we had a melt source and a hydrated upper mantle, a lack of volcanism altogether, then when it re returned it was a dry mantle source with a mantle plume uh, component. So we'll talk about these in, 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 in more detail here. So if we look at the outcrops of 30 to 20 million year old material, it includes the John Day outcrops that you see here in, in Oregon. Uh, the cascade volcanism was occurring, you know, at the same time over here. Um, much of these outcrops are covered by younger volcanism in the Oregon high lava plain right through here, but then they reappear in scattered outcrops in this area. Some of these brought up along faults, you know, basement range uh, faults like Steens Mountain and, and Abram Rim, for example, and we see these rocks down here in northeastern California, northwestern uh, Nevada as well, and in Idaho, the Salmon Creek volcanics that we have over here in Idaho fall within, within that category. If we look at the composition of these volcanics, they're, they're not just calcalkaline volcanics, uh, which would normally be perhaps similar to what we have in the Cascades. They actually have high potassium, higher than what we see in the Cascades. And what that tells us is that the source is a hydrated mantle, but it's, but it's highly, uh, strongly hydrated. Um, it uh, has a very high concentration of water-soluble uh, uh, elements uh, uh, associated with it. And the model for this, since it's in the back arc area, at the same time we have subduction zone volcanism occurring in the Cascades, something has to be going on here. And what we suggested, and this partly follows on other people's work, particularly uh, Mahoud and, uh, and, and Kobel, is that the, uh, the plume that arrived uh, at, at 40 million years then underplated uh, the subducting slab, but it's very buoyant and uh, it pushed up the slab, but it also heated the slab and uplift the slab with the slab, uh, the decompression along with the, with the uh, increased heat liberated water uh, from the upper portion slab that carried with it these water soluble elements. Uh, and then uh, melting began once the high, as a result of uh, mantle convection and the mantle wedge uh, to produce this type of volcanism on, on the surface. And all these outcrops are outlined on this map by this uh, blue-green dotted line. So this is the 30 to 20 million year uh, area that we have this type of um, uh, volcanic activity. And within that, we have the solid area here, which is also the same age 30 to 20 million years ago, but it's a little bit different. It's similar in that it's high potassium calc alkaline, but they have a characteristic uh, that also defines them as, as adikite uh, rocks. And adikites are uh, thought to be produced uh, not by the melting of uh, ultramafic mantle, but rather uh, through the melting of, uh, uh, of mafic material uh, as, as opposed to mantle, it would be crustal material in this case. If we look at a, a simple uh, PT di diagram here, in essence, a, a phase diagram, I, I suppose, and, you can see two different geothermal uh, gradients here with uh, uh, potential temperatures uh, that would, wouldn't be that unusual in the, in the mantle. But the point I wanna make here on this diagram is we look at the solidest temperature of basalt here compared to the solidest temperature of fertile peridotite. And here uh, is uh, lithosphere, stenosphere boundary. 
So if we have a mantle plume that's going to add heat, it's going to be right here in the upper portion of the cenosphere. And adding a little bit of heat, just a little bit, uh, would instantly cause the basalt slab to start, start to melt if, in fact, it's there. But you would have to heat that up a lot more before you start to get uh, the, the mantle to, uh, to melt. So the point of this diagram is that it's very easy uh, to melt uh, basaltic uh, crust you know, at, at depth, particularly if there's a mantle plume uh, uh, present. And there's a lot of controversy, and I don't want to ignore this about adikites, because they can, in fact, be produced in a lot of different ways. But we believe that the evidence here is more consistent with melting of oceanic crust from uh, uh, the subducting plate. One of the characteristic uh, uh, chemical characteristics of adikite uh, has, uh, is in the strontium yttrium ratio, which is very high. Normally, if you have basalt, uh, strontium uh, behaves as a compatible element because it's uh, compatible with uh, plagioclase. But in a subducting slab, the slab will, uh, will subduct downward into higher pressure conditions uh, so that it's converted to eclogite. And uh, this is below the stability level of plagioclase. So the strontium now becomes an incompatible element. And that means if you melt uh, that mathic material, strontium will be liberated and go into the melt very, very quickly. Yttrium, on the other hand, is normally an incompatible element. And um, uh, it changes to a compatible element in eclogite because it's uh, compatible in, in garnet. So the behavior in strontium and yttrium is entirely different than it normally would be. And in this case, you get a, a field here of very high strontium yttrium values uh, compared to the yttrium values uh, that define adikite as a melt from mafic uh, crust. And when we look at most of the 30 to 20 million year old adikites, they fall in this normal zone of cow cow and volcanism. But right here, many of these jump up into a transitional area, uh, more adikite of adikite affinity, and then they continue into some very strong adikites we have in a couple of these uh, uh, outcrop areas of the Pine Forest Range and the Salmon Creek uh, volcano, uh, volcanics. But geographically, they form here into a zone that's northeast trending, the same trend that we have in the Yeltsin hotspot track and very uh, uh, line adjacent to the Yeltsin hotspot track. So that's why we originally referred to this as the adikite, the 30 to 20 million year adikite hotspot track, which would be a continuation of that. And then we have this hiatus that began between 17 and 20 million years. So the, all that fairly voluminous cow cow and volcanism, the back hole area, just stopped very abruptly. And we can see this easily in the age of age. So these are the ages compiled by Kobol and Mahud in 2012, and this is the hiatus. Uh, uh, produced. And they suggested the re reason for this hiatus is, like our original model, the plume, uh, or I shouldn't say from our original because it first came from Kobo and Mahut, but they suggested that the plume rose, uh, continued to uplift uh, the plate to the extent that it cut off uh, flow in the mantle wedge. And that, that counterflow is what you have to have in order to produce subduction zone volcanism and the back arc volcanism that we were discussing. But the slab may have risen all the way up and juxtaposed itself uh, uh, to the underbelly of the North American plate of the created terrains right through here, and that would produce the hiatus of volcanic activity. Um, and then we abruptly went into another period of volcanism, which is solely a uh, bimodal volcanism from 17 to 15 million years. It's a very small period of two, uh, two million years. And the source of melting was entirely different. It was a dry mantle source, which is typical of foliatic volcanism. So what we suggest here is that the, the plume then broke through the slab and uh, through decompression, uh, as it rose, it uh, hit the underside of uh, the accreted uh, uh, terrains of uh, the North American plate and then started to melt voluminously to produce the initial eruptions of, of the Columbia River uh, of basalt. Now, I want to just pause here for a second to point something out. What we have here, a lot of people would look at this large amount of, of uh, mantle, plume mantle, and think, well, that's the plume head. But according to this, this model, the plume head is what produced Celestia, so this is not the plume head. So why then do we have a large amount of mantle material here? Well, the reason is, is because once the tail entered the trench, uh, it was shielded by the slab, but the flux of the tail continued to feed material into the underbelly of the slab. So that means that we grew a large amount of plume material underneath the slab. We had over about 15 million years to do that until it then broke through. And uh, so it's actually an accumulation, like an accumulated head, if you will. It's not a true 
plume head. And this explains uh, the volume of uh, the relative volume of the climb river basalts compared to other uh, flood basalt provinces. Now we can see these um, sequences in different places here in A Bear Rim in uh, Oregon. You have the cow cow foot volcanism here, high potassium. Then we have a break in slope where we have the steams basalts. And the hiatus between those represents the 20 to 17 million year hiatus that we talked about before. So after 17 MA, we started to build volcanism at Steens Mountain, uh, continuing upward into the Picture Gorge basalts, which now we know the Picture Gorge basalts have ages that are as old or older than the Steens basalts, and eventually into the uh, chief phase of Dykesmark. In the main phase of uh, volcanism, uh, uh, lasted only about 1 million years. Uh, we've narrowed that down smaller and smaller time. We now believe the entire main phase, about 85% of the entire province erupted uh, in about a million years or, 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 or less from, the, from the spike swarms uh, with a rapid progression to the north into the Chief Joseph uh, 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 dike swarm. But it didn't stop there. Uh, you know, we always, you know, we, we always like to be kind of provincial in our geology. But if we look at a little bit south, uh, we can connect these again temporally and spatially uh, to the Northern Nevada Rift System, which has dikes of the same age that erupted from 17 to 15 million years ago, uh, a bimodal province because there's rhyolites that erupted on the surface here. And if we look at these uh, kind of fuchsia colored linear features here, these are aeromagnetic anomalies that correspond with deep seated mid crustal uh, keel dikes uh, that would have in essence been magma chambers that would have fed the, uh, the much smaller dikes we have on the surface in the Northern Nevada Rift. Uh, so what we know is this volcanism continued over a, a linear area uh, that's very extensive from central Nevada all the way up uh, to where you guys are, uh, you know, in the Columbia Basin uh, uh, up here, erupting over a very, very short period of time. Um, the other thing I want to point out here uh, of interest uh, is that this period, a uh, very short-lived period from 17, 15 million years ago, also turns out to be uh, uh, an abrupt initiation of uh, basin and range extension of, 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 of the same age. This began uh, across every, all this area that you see here in pink uh, began between 17 and 16 million years ago. So that leaves us with a lot of interesting questions because the prevailing thought as I've written down here is that basin range extension began when torsional stress was fully imposed on the continental interior by plate boundary tectonics. You know, um, I mean, you look at this and you say, well, it has to somehow be associated with this incredible event that happened, this incredible volcanic event, you know. Uh, so one question that obviously comes to mind is, is it possible there is no mantle plume? In other words, could the initiation of basin range extension not be the result of a mantle plume, um, but it, the extension itself uh, could it be the root cause of flood basalt volcanism instead of a mantle plume? Uh, this is an idea put back put out by Bill Dickinson many, many years ago, and it seems reasonable. Uh, but in reality, if you look at where we have by far the greatest volume of volcanism is the Chief Joseph Dyke Swarm uh, over here, this is an area where we have the smallest amount of extension, very little extension. In fact, there's no extension we can recognize of that age between 17 and 15 million years. Uh, other than the dikes the, the, the themselves, but yet we produce a huge volume of, uh, of basalt. But on the other hand, where we have the greatest amount of extension is in the basin range province, where we have the smallest volume of uh, volcanism. Uh, so that's inconsistent with, with, that, with that model. But something else that's inconsistent with that model is that when we look at the, the oldest uh, structures uh, that began 17 to, to 15 million years ago in basin range, they trend off to the, uh, to the north northwest. Uh, sorry, the north northeast. But when we look at the dikes associated with those events, almost all of them, except at Steens Mountain, trend off to the north northwest. So they're entirely different trends. And most people now uh, believe that uh, the dikes associated with the northern Nevada Rift and the, the Chief Judge of Dike, Dike Swarm and the other Dike Swarm are not at all a product of extension, but instead they're the result of uh, high magnetic pressures, uh, overpressures and forceful injection along the, 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 those trends. Another question, could we turn this around and say, well, could the plume, we were asking the question of whether or not 
ex basin range extension produce the volcanism or whether or not it's the mantle plume that produced basin range extension. Um, and in reality, I don't think either one is uh, is correct. I, I think the, the evidence, um, I'm not sure how much of that you heard, but the, the evidence on whether basin range extension produced the volcanism um, is, uh, th there's too much evidence against that. Uh, so I would say no. But could a plume uh, produce, be the main cause of basin range extension? I think that that's not likely either because there's too much uh, very well documented evidence for um, uh, plate tectonics being a, a main contributor to basin range extension, as well as uh, the uplifted orogenic plateau in the Nevada Plano. Uh, and so what I think in, in what happened here in reality is that we had an interior of the plate that was really on the verge of collapse, you know, a high plateau under extensional stress. And once the plume arrived, it was really the straw that broke the, broke the camel's back. You know, it was the catalyst of, of, of the event, of the, of the initiation, but not the main cause of, of, of the initiation itself. So um, just to, um, um, to finish this off a little bit, I want to talk a little bit about the geophysics here, because we have really good geophysics in, in this area. And this is a, a really great paper uh, produced by Obreski and others uh, back in, in 2010. Where they took, uh, where they modeled uh, the mantle plume. Sorry, they modeled uh, the downgoing slab that we can see today, and what they found is that um, underneath Oregon and Northern California uh, into Nevada, uh, what I want you to focus on is over here on the the right hand side, this three dimensional diagram, where you can see the downgoing plate. Uh, here's the Juan de Fuca plate. Here's the Gorda plate. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> and, and what you'll notice is that they're terminated here. They're truncated at a very shallow level uh, between 400 and 160 uh, kilometers depth. Uh, and then there's a big hole right in here uh, in the downgoing plate. Uh, and then the plate reappears over here as F1, which is a, a segment of the Farallon plate. So so this is the, the actual data that produced this model that Robreski suggested was a result of plume impingement, the Yellowstone plume, uh, that broke the plate apart, producing this, uh, this hole that we see in the plate. And it also produces kind of this sort of an echelon uh, feature between the Gorda plate and, and uh, the Farallon plate. You can see it here, and you can see it here. Um, the other anomalies uh, in this uh, in the seismic data is that we have uh, low density hot anomalies, uh, one of which uh, defines the Yellowstone plume right here that rises right into the hole and then it spreads across into the Yellowstone Snake River plain. It also goes right into the hole. So that's consistent with the plume uh, producing the uh, the slab hole that we that we have here. And if we look at this in cross section, there's these two cross sections. Uh, this is by uh, Schmidt and, hum and Humphreys, uh, A and A prime, and you can see them over here. This is the downgoing uh, 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 Gorda plate right through here. And then we have the slab gap, and this is the Farallon plate segment. And you can see it here in B, even better exposed here and here. So this is the Gorda plate. You see it here. Here's the Farallon plate. You see, you see it here. So what we think has happened here, and again, this is what we see today, is we go back to our model, this area that broke, you know, when the plate broke, on the eastern side, it broke through uh, to produce uh, uh, this uh, tholeitic bimodal volcanic activity at 17 mil million years ago. But we had another break right here. And that's why we have a break on this side and a break on this side. So what we're looking at here in this portion of the slab is the original portion of the slab here that's now descended down into the transition zone of the mantle. You know, it's cold and heavy, so it's uh, it, it's sunk back down farther in, into the mantle. And what it's left is a gap here uh, between the truncation of the Gorda plate here and the uh, remnant that's left over uh, uh, here. So, um, when I was reading this, I, I I was talking to my field buddy Marty Ross, and we decided we need to go. And you know, if this is true, then we ought to be able to see this on the surface. You know, we ought to be able to see the difference here as opposed to over here. What's going on? What's happening on the surface? And we mapped out the, this area right in this region of California and in, in, in Nevada, and uh, we got uh, some good age dates on this uh, material too. And what we found 
is that there's a dike swarm here called the Smoke Creek Dike Swarm. And we got argon argon ages on this and uh, the oldest age turned out to be 16.7 mil million years. And this is the same age as uh, the initiation of Columbia River basalt uh, volcanism with, with Steen's basalt. But these are not tholeitic, they're calcalkaline. And then when we continued to map off to the west, we noticed that there was a change in the style of volcanism from uh, dike intrusion to the formation of large uh, shield volcanoes of basaltic andesite that were younger. So here at the dike swarm, the ages are from 16 to 17. Here there's shield volcanoes that erupted from 14 to 18. And farther to the west, uh, the volcanism again changed character to mostly the scoria cones that were between eight a million years to the present time, all calc alkaline. So this represents actually the ancestral uh, cascades. Uh, well, well, I, I mean the ancestral in 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 the sense. Well, between between sixteen and, and uh, between sixteen million years and the present. So the present is not ancestral. But what we had over that time uh, uh, frame is that we had a westward progression of volcanism. And we attribute that westward uh, progression to rollback of the plate as it broke away from uh, this portion. So it broke to the east to produce uh, flood basalt vol volcanism. It broke off on the west uh, to, uh, to reinitiate calcalkaline volcanism that then started to migrate to the west because a slab rolled back in this direction. So the, the plate became steeper to its current position over here off the map at Lassen uh, uh, National Park. And that um, rollback regression occurs at about 7.8 kilometers per million years. And that's been recognized elsewhere at, uh, at a very similar rate. So, um, so, okay, so once that occurred, we're now up to about 15 million years. The rest of this will go very quickly. The rhyolites that you see on this diagram, I don't have basalts, but, but the rhyolites that are shown here that begin at 17 million years from 17 to 15 are just shown here in, in yellow. And they're fairly widely dispersed. Uh, but then when we go farther to the east, the rhyolites become younger uh, between about 14 to 10 million years. Uh, and they're more focused on on the Snake River Plain hotspot track, but they don't they don't easily correspond with a nice progression. You know, there's a lot of overlap in some of the ages. There's a general progression of younger ages to the to the east, but not uh, you know not so much that you could define it nicely as a well-defined hotspot track. But then after that time, after 10 million years, this is where when the rhyolites became even more focused, and and at that point, we start to have a progression of ages that are identical uh, to plate motion uh, above a stationary hotspot. And um, uh, so the hotspot uh, today is at Yellowstone, is sitting right on top of, 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 of the plume tail. Um, another way we know there's a plume is because it's been resolved. You know, this by Nelson and Grand, that's resolved it all the way down to the core mantle boundary. It rises up underneath Yellowstone right through here. If we look at Yellowstone National Park, you know, we see it seismically. This is the plume tail right through here. Underneath the park itself, you know, we've had a continuation rhyolite volcanism uh, with a continuation of uh, uh, ages that we see here. Um, we've had three of these super eruptions and large calderas that formed over the last two million years. The last one at 640 million years. Why is that? Well, because the hot plume melts, it produces basalt. Basalt rises up into a seismically defined magma chamber of basalt. Uh, that magma chamber heats up the crust to produce rhyolite volcanism. It produces an upper magma chamber of rhyolite. And this is the magma chamber that's periodically erupted in the Yellowstone caldera uh, to produce these super eruptions with caldera uh, collapse. And there we are at the end of the hotspot. And there we are at the end of this talk. So thanks for, uh, thanks for listening.